On the 29th of November 2001, the third episode of Walking with Beasts, Land of Giants, was released. This episode is set 25 million years ago in the late Oligocene Epoch of Mongolia. The episode starts in a canyon in the middle of the night, where we are introduced to the main star of this episode, referred to here as an Indra Kathir. So, right off the bat, we have a slightly confusing name situation. The animal in question is the genus Paraceratherium, a giant member of the rhinoceros group, and whilst the show never explicitly refers to it as its invalid name, Indra Kathirium, it's customary for the series to refer to most creatures by their genus name, but it's not technically incorrect to call them Indracathirs. The model looks incredible. The skin texture especially looks amazing. Accuracy-wise, it's basically flawless, other than I've seen some recent reconstructions give it a more tapir-like trunk than a rhino-like prehensile lip. Naming shenanigans out of the way, we see a mother giving birth to a young male after a two-year-long pregnancy. Her newborn is in danger, however, from a pair of carnivorous hyenodon. I love this first shot of them with their eyeshine piercing through the darkness. Great stuff. The narration correctly explains how their name is a bit of a misnomer, as they are not actually close relatives of hyenas. It also describes them as being as big as rhinos, which leads me to believe these are meant to represent the largest species, H. gigas, or gigas. The model on the whole is quite good, and I really love the colour scheme. There are some problems with it though. First of all, the sabre teeth. Hyenodon did have very large canines, but nothing to this extent. The snout should also be a little bit longer. Hyenodon gigas is also only known from the early Oligocene, so it would already be extinct, but it's possible there were large hyenodonts in Mongolia at this time, such as Megaloterodon from nearby China. The mother Indrakthir towers over the carnivores and defends her baby from the attackers by keeping it between her legs, charging and kicking at the predators. The scene fades to black before revealing the title at sunrise, probably my favourite title scene in the series. So in my last review I forgot to mention that Whale Killer was filmed in Florida, which is my bad, it just slipped my mind when I was writing the script. I mention this as this episode was filmed in the arid desert regions of Arizona and Mexico, and it is such a cool and fitting setting for this time and place based on fossil finds from the Hassanda Gol formation. The narration then explains how the Oligocene has seen major changes in the climate after the Grand Kupur extinction, the beginnings of which we saw in the last episode. Life has continued to evolve, of course, but the composition of communities around the globe has changed radically since the Eocene. One example are the giant Indracathirs, of which we see the calf has survived the night and will be our central focus for this episode. The puppet of the head looks superb as well. As he learns how to walk, we are introduced to one of the more peculiar animals of this time, referred to here as a Calicathir. I'm assuming this is meant to represent Calicotherium, however, the time and place would make more sense for it to be Sizotherium, as Calicotherium is only known from the later Miocene era. Park. Regardless, it is a member of an obscure family of herbivorous mammals, most closely related to horses, many of which walk on their knuckles, shown off with some wonderfully crafted puppets. I love the colour scheme, and I can't really see much inaccuracy with it, however this is also because they don't specify a genus, which confounds things quite a bit. Either way, I really like this model. We then cut to a gorgeous shot of a small lake in the middle of a desert, dotted with bushes. The narration explains how in the Oligocene, the world is now much more seasonal than than before. Mongolia especially sees long dry seasons, punctuated by short and violent wet seasons. This has shaped the animals as well. This point is driven home with the introduction of a very popular creature, referred to here as an entelodont. These guys are also known by the pseudonyms Hogs from Hell, Hell Pigs, and Terminator Pigs, just to name a few. Yet, ironically, they are not very closely related to pigs. I touched on this in my last review when discussing Andrew Sarkis, as Entelodonts have had a similar reshuffling on the mammal family tree. As you might expect, they were originally classified as close relatives of pigs and other even-hoofed ungulates, based simply on their overall morphological similarities. However, more recent studies have shown that they, as well as Andrew Sarkis, 
are genetically more closely related to hippos and cetaceans, forming the mouthful of a clade, Cetanchodontomorpha. As for its actual appearance, it really is iconic, but sadly they are a tad inaccurate, if only for the severe shrink wrapping on their heads, presumably to make them look as grotesque as possible, which I think they definitely succeeded at. More modern reconstructions have these animals looking much more hippo-like, fitting considering their family ties, with their ridiculously huge skulls covered by plenty of flesh and muscle. An odd trend I'm noticing in this episode is that few of the creatures are referred to by a specific genus. I think this is intended to be Entelodon, however Entelodon became extinct in the early Oligocene and was also much smaller than the creature shown here. Its later relative, Paraentelodon from China, however, ticks pretty much all of the boxes in terms of size, time, and rough geographic location. So in my mind, these represent Paraentelodon. Whew, okay, back to the episode. We see a male scare off a family of bear dogs, who we'll discuss more later, as it goes to the lake to drink. The bear dogs are then scared off again by the mother Indrakafir. She doesn't stay for long, however, as a second Entelodon appears and challenges the first. The noisy and aggressive animals put off the Indrakafir, and we see the fantastically grotesque head puppet of the Entelodons as they engage one another. This is not just for viewer excitement, as bite marks have been found on the skulls of other Entelodons, suggesting they they were incredibly hostile towards one another. The narration says it best, Entelodonts are their own worst enemy. As such, we see the loser's face covered in blood. We then cut back to the Indrakathir calf, playing dead to avoid unwanted attention from potential predators. This is purely speculative behaviour, but it is very plausible. He rises when he hears his mother return. A week later, the mother decides it is time to leave the safety of the canyon. The following scene is simply incredible. The imagery, cinematography, and the score are all just awe-inspiring. They truly capture the majesty and utter enormity of the Indrakathirs, as we see several out on the plains towering over everything around them. The narration states that when it comes to size, no other mammal even comes close. However, the Asian straight-tusked elephant, Paleoloxodon nomadicus, might have been larger overall, but Paraceratherium appears to have still been taller. Keen to explore, the young Indrakathir comes across a mother bear dog, so if this creature looks familiar, it's because its model was used for the quote-unquote Les Mesodon from New Dawn. Once again, this creature is not referred to by a specific genus in the episode, but in the book, The Complete Guide to Prehistoric Life, it is referred to as Cynodictus. Overall, I think the model is really good, however there is one issue. Here it is shown walking digitigrade, that is, on its toes like a dog. However, Amphicyonids, or bear dogs, actually walked plantigrade, with their soles touching the ground, like bears. Cynodictus also became extinct in the early Oligocene, so it should not be here, but unlike some of the other misplaced creatures in this episode, I'm unsure if there were any bear dogs in late Oligocene Asia that could act as a substitute. If any of you know more on this, please do let me know in the comments. Anyways, the bear dog scares the calf back to its mother. We then see the calf learning the ways of life. One such lesson is sniffing dung and getting right up into the lens. We then get a very interesting scene. We see the mother's previous calf approach the pair, and the mother violently repels him as she has to devote all of her energy to her current calf. The narration foreshadows that this very same thing will happen to our calf one day. We then see a group of Calicathias browsing near the Indrakathir pair before the dry season kills off much of the vegetation. We then get a cute speculative scene of the calf imitating his mother eating leaves, even though he doesn't need food yet. Nearby, however, a hyenodon is stalking, giving us our first good look at it during the daytime. The predator then darts towards one of the calicathirs, pounces and bites it by the neck before pulling it down to the ground for the kill. The narration states that Hyenodon's jaws could crush bone, however Hyenodon's teeth were better designed for shearing flesh rather than crushing bone like an actual hyena. It also states that they can eat absolutely everything on a corpse. I don't know of any evidence on this, but again, if any of you know more about this than me, please do let me know in the comments. We don't get to see any proof of this feat, as the Hyenodon is approached by three Entelodonts. In response, he poops in fear and runs. 
Okay, he actually attempts to cover the scent of the carcass, but to no avail, as he is bullied off of the kill by the scavengers. This is also thought to be accurate behaviour of Intellidons, being opportunistic kleptoparasites, using their bulk to steal kills from other predators, such as bears do with wolves. Three months later, we see the effects the dry season has had on the land. A lone Calicathea drinks from a shrinking puddle amidst dead or dying plants. He is then just utterly befuddled by the sight of a very calm Intellidont also wanting to drink. Seriously though, why is this face so funny? Well, whilst this Calicathea contemplates everything, we see our dynamic duo are also struggling in the drought. The mother being so dehydrated means that she can't produce any milk for the calf. The Indricathirs opt to move in the cool night to avoid overheating. An advantage they have in being so huge is that they can operate for longer periods without food, making them ideally suited to an arid environment. The pair join an older female, as she is highly likely to know if there is any water nearby. Turns out this was a safe bet, as they find a muddy puddle before the calf collapses, and they quench their thirst and sleep the rest of the night. The next morning, the calf is at last able to suckle again. At last the rains arrive, and as foreshadowed earlier, they come in a torrent. The plains are drenched, thwarting a hyenodon chasing an intellidont in, in slow motion. motion. We then see the Indicathirs in the rain, and the calf looks... happy? Sure, the exact opposite can be said for the mother bear dog, whose burrow has been flooded by the rains and drowned her pup. The bear dog really is just this episode's punching bag, it would seem. It hasn't had a single flattering scene. She gets scared away from the watering hole, the calf unwittingly endangers her cubs, and then her den gets flooded and kills her babies. Ugh. <sighs> Justice for Bear Dog. We then see the Indricathirs having to cross a newly formed river. The mother can simply wade through the water, whereas the hesitant calf must swim or else get left behind. Eventually, he crosses the river and struggles up a steep bank. We then see the mother reject his attempts to suckle, weaning him off her milk so that he will learn to feed himself. We then see some really cool time-lapse shots of plants blooming as colour returns to the plains. In the next scene, it is time for the Indicathirs to mate. Now that the mother is no longer nursing her calf, she has become fertile again. As such, a young male has caught her scent but is rejected by the mother. A second male then appears, urinating to mark his territory, and somewhere a postosuchus is crying. The pair watch on as the two males battle for the right to mate. There's also a cool shot where in the foreground, you can see how the impacts of the fight disturb an ant colony. Luckily this time there's no baby birds around. One male finally backs down, and the victor proceeds to mate with the mother. The narration alludes to some calves being killed whilst adult males mate with their mothers. Luckily ours gets out with just a kick to the head. Two years later, we briefly see a group of Calicathirs before finding out the mother Indricathir is pregnant and expecting soon. We see the calf is now three years old and practicing the skills his mother has taught him. The narration, however, then alludes to how nothing he has learned will prepare him for tomorrow. The next day, the mother chases her calf away to give her new calf the best chance of life. We then see our calf wandering off on his own into the plains. There are some brilliant cloud time-lapse shots before seeing our calf, whom the narration explains has most likely been given a limp by a young adult Indricathir and is headed back to his mother for protection. We see her with her new calf and she scares him off as she now only sees him as a threat. It's a genuinely sad moment seeing our calf go through the event we saw towards the beginning. Months later, we see him again, near an Intelodon, browsing on leaves. I appreciate this inclusion, as they were indeed believed to have been omnivorous, and so I'm glad they haven't been portrayed as wholly bloodthirsty carnivores. The narration says he is dangerously close, However, he proceeds to charge and scare the Intelligent away. The narration then states how he is now big enough to look after himself, before knocking the camera over at the end of the episode, because... reasons. So, overall, Land of Giants is kind of a mixed bag for me. I think the first half is excellent, with plenty of excitement and incredible imagery. The second half, however, I found dragged a bit for me. This episode suffers from the same problem as the second episode of Walking with Dinosaurs, Time of the Titans, in that they both have too much focus on a single creature for my liking. In fact, these two episodes are very similar in terms of plot, in that they both focus on a huge land animal that we follow from birth slash hatching, with the other animals around them kind of just taking a back seat. 
It's not that I don't like the main creatures they focus on, I just wish the others could get some more attention. Granted, I think Land of Giants comes out slightly ahead of Time of the Titans in this regard, as the other creatures have more time to shine on their own, whereas every single creature in Time of the Titans is only seen alongside the Diplodocus. Of course, some may prefer that style of narrative, helping to sell the idea that you are seeing the world right alongside the main character. I personally, however, find myself becoming a bit bored seeing so much of a single creature, but maybe that's just me. I found this episode to be very charming, honestly. The tone takes on a more light-hearted, humorous tone, basically the opposite of New Dawn. I feel this episode could have also either been set in early Oligocene Mongolia or late Oligocene China to remedy some of the space and time hiccups present, but it's not really an issue. I still enjoyed the episode a lot, but I definitely prefer the first half. Thank you so much for watching, and stay tuned for my review of the fourth episode of Walking with Beasts, next of kin. Bye bye now.